Melody Baker was a lawyer, a mother of two teenagers, and the wife of Will Baker, her true love. She was also an extremely attractive woman at 42. She had dark hair, dark eyes, a slender body, and a killer smile. She was also very intelligent and had an intuitive understanding of other people. But, but, now she sat at the banquet table, and her marriage and family were in grave danger, and all because of herself. Her husband, Will, and her client, Robert Dawson, glared at each other with hatred. The conflict flared up because of her. Robert wanted to spend the weekend having sex with her and leave Will with his companion, the young and beautiful Gina. In fact, before she saw and heard Will's reaction to Robert's trade proposal, she had been looking forward to taking a break from her marriage. It was easy. Robert Dawson seemed incredibly sexually attractive to her, so much so that she was willing to let Will sleep with Gina. This whole situation started a few months ago when Robert was sued by a multinational bank. He approached their firm for representation and their firm appointed her to handle the case. They worked on the case together, with others from his company and others from her company. But the two main participants became closer. They started going to dinners without others. They started discussing more personal things at these dinners. They started staying late for meetings, where they exchanged more of their life stories. Mel was well aware that she was in danger of breaking her marriage vows because of Robert's attraction. He was single. He was known to be a skilled lover. That's what his company vice president Gloria Maine said. He was bigger than Will and more handsome. Smoother, too. Will had some rough sides, still, due to his upbringing. After some late-night meetings, she knew she wanted to try Robert. Try it on, so to speak. Work on the claim has intensified. There were offers to settle the case, and there were extensive requests for evidence. As the case escalated, so did the relationship between Robert and Mel. Now he openly pursued her when they were alone. She allowed him a kiss or a hug. But she resisted going further, despite her strong desire. Her desire to go this far with Robert. She was a woman who did not hide the truth from herself, so she knew what she wanted. She just didn't know how to get it without ruining her life. One evening during a late meeting, Robert suggested that they should take a couple of hours and go to his hotel room. Mel immediately rejected this offer. She was tempted, but she wasn't inclined to cheat on Will. It was mainly a matter of honesty and honor on her part. But, she admitted to herself, it was also because her husband was so determined. She had the idea that Will would find out if she slept with Robert. As soon as it happens. And that would be the end for her and Will. Mel told Robert this before they separated that evening. Then the first, real kiss, happened. And Mel was confused by this. After this, the relationship between them cooled a little. But not for long. Negotiations for an agreement were close to completion. Mel deceived the other party by offering additional, more specific requests for information. Those that showed that the case would be examined with full disclosure, nothing would be hidden. As a result, the case was settled on terms favorable to Robert. After signing the paperwork and submitting it for registration, Robert invited Mel to an early dinner to celebrate. His idea of celebration included the loss of clothing. And Mel? Mel said no. It wasn't exactly a hard no, really. As they walked to Mel's car parked outside the restaurant, Robert said, I have a proposal. Mel smiled. I know. You just made it, and I just said no. Robert said, I'll be honored at a charity dance next Friday here in town. I'm inviting you and Will. I'll have a very beautiful young woman with me. We've been close for a long time. Mel frowned. What do you mean, Robert? At some point this evening, I'll make a trade with Will. He gets Gina and I get you for the weekend. Oh, oh God. At this moment, Mel lost a little of her confidence and calm. She was really embarrassed. Do you think he'll agree? Robert was all in. No, maybe, not likely. Robert pulled her towards him and kissed her. He said, I'll send you an invitation. You and Will can sit at the main table with me and Gina. There will be dancing. Gina is a professional dancer. She'll be a great partner for Will. Mel said, 
We'd be happy to come to dinner, of course. As for sharing, don't do anything until we discuss it further. Maybe when we see how dinner goes. Okay. But Mel, I assure you that if we do this, you'll have a great time. She got into the car and drove away. She knew full well that Robert's statement was true. That evening, she told Will about the agreement and about the Friday night dance. Will said, Does this mean Robert is coming home? Will's radar went into overdrive at those words. But he didn't say anything. Will was a writer. He wrote everything. Thrillers, detective stories, short stories, serious fiction, and, most recently, a book about science fiction. He wasn't exactly famous, but he made very good money. Better than Mel's salary at a big law firm. His work was mainly done at home. This way he could be close to his two children. Sherry, 17, and Mark, 15. He has been a stay-at-home dad since they were little. There were times when he had to travel out of town to promote books. And just recently, he had to travel to Los Angeles to consult on a movie being made based on his latest thriller, Danger Man. Mostly, however, he sent his children to school and wrote. He was a prolific writer, fast and confident. Very little rewriting was required. Will was able to do this because he was an extremely thoughtful person who could describe in detail something that interested him. He could replay scenes in his head as if they were on video with sound and pictures, and then he could write it down. This quality bothered Mel when she refused Robert's offer of a quickie. Will never turned off this analytical look at the people around him, including her and children. Many times he noticed something in children that helped prevent problems. The two children considered Will to be some kind of magician. They knew they couldn't hide important things. So does Mel. The banquet in Robert's honor was a luxurious event in a luxurious location in the city center. The children went to Mel's parents for the weekend, which, she thought, left the weekend free for whatever antics her parents could come up with. Mel was very nervous when they arrived. She wanted what she wanted, but she was still unsure about the proposed exchange. That uncertainty eased a little when she saw Gina. Gina was like a living dream. Mel noticed Will's glances at her when they were introduced by Robert. This caused her to feel jealous and insecure. Maybe she shouldn't have risked letting Will have Gina. However, this thought distracted her from fully considering the main question of whether Will would agree to the exchange. She skipped this review when jealousy came over her. The foursome ate, drank, and talked at the head table with Robert's vice president, Gloria, and her husband, Rick. The dinner went well, and then Robert received his award with some speeches. Robert's speech was a small masterpiece, combining modesty with sly self-congratulation. He received applause and returned to the table. Will congratulated him, as did the others. The band then started playing a tune, and after a few numbers where they danced with whoever brought them, Robert led Mel onto the dance floor. Mel was captivated by Robert now more so than before. He was so smooth. Now, dancing with him, she realized how strong and athletic he was, and she was also aware of how excited he was about dancing. Her. Mel didn't really notice that Will and Gina were still at the table. Robert whispered to her as they began their second dance. Are we agreed? I can propose after this song. Mel said, yes, do it. She was beyond worried that Gina would steal her man. When they returned to the table, Mel noticed that Will and Gina didn't seem to be moving. Robert asked Will about it, and Will said he watched them dance. He looked straight at Mel. Mel was ready to call Robert off, but he said, Will, Mel and I have been working closely together in recent months. I, well, I hope she and I can spend the weekend together. You and Gina might too. Mel looked at her husband, but he only looked at Robert. There was a long pause. Then Will said, No. This was a decisive refusal. No explanation, but quite definite. Perhaps even more than that. At this point, Mel's hope for a weekend of sex with Robert was dashed. She knew this tone of her husband. She was ready to warn Robert. But Robert quickly insisted. He said, Maybe you should ask Mel. 
Will's response was quick and alarming. He said, I'm not going to ask her, Robert. Our marriage is on the rocks right now. She could easily push him over the edge with the wrong answer. That would be a shame. We have kids in high school. Robert said, well, I'll ask her. Mel, will you accept my offer? Mel looked at Will. There were no concessions at all. She knew she was in big trouble. She stood up, refused Robert, and took Will's hand as they left. Will and Mel were silent during the ride home. Mel was scared and on the verge of tears. She knew full well that Will was aware of the intrigue, the conspiracy that she and Robert were trying to arrange at the dance. Will clearly avoided forcing Mel to say whether she supported the trade too early, but Mel knew that Will was aware that she wanted this, and she was afraid that such a realization could destroy them, because after all, it was a cynical attempt on her part to sleep with another man. Silence remained between them as they entered the house. Will went upstairs and took a shower. Mel sat in the kitchen feeling dizzy. She looked around the house where she and Will had been so happy raising their family. After a while, Mel thought about the evening. She thought about how Will had avoided making her say outright that she wanted an exchange. She thought this might be his way of stopping his long slide toward divorce. If she said it, it couldn't be ignored. Although they both knew she wanted an exchange, it wasn't right on the table for both of them to see and discuss. She had no acceptable excuses, and the truth would be painful. She heard the shower stop working. She waited. Then she went upstairs. Will was wearing sweatpants and sneakers. He glanced at her. He said, I'm going to go for a run. I don't know why I took a shower. He slowly walked down the stairs and left. Will's apathetic behavior was alarming to Mel. She saw that he was not as calm about what was happening as he seemed at the dance. She took a shower and waited for him to return. It took an hour. She was sitting on a chair in the corner of the bed, trying to read a book on her Kindle. It's a useless matter. The run calmed Will down. He avoided directly acknowledging Mel's desire for Robert and her willingness to act on it. If she had ever spoken in favor of the proposed exchange, he would have left her alone at dinner and perhaps left her forever. This was something he couldn't stand. Mel should have known this after 20 years. In fact, he felt like she knew it, but she continued anyway. His efforts to prevent her from openly disrespecting him had now left the whole situation in a precarious state. He decided to leave everything as it was and see what happens next. He thought it would be nice to have some kind of explanation for her behavior, but he didn't really need it. She was so consumed by passion for this guy that she lost her bearings. Perhaps they should go to counseling. What will it give? If she didn't bring it up herself, he would give her time to think. But he will also start following her and her client. When he returned from his run, Mel was reading in the bedroom. Will entered the house, turned off the downstairs light, and went up to the bedroom. He undressed and went to take a shower again. Coming out of the bathroom, clean and silent, he pulled on his boxers and T-shirt and hopped into bed, without saying a word. Soon, Mel turned off the light and also went to bed. She didn't know whether to try to start a conversation. She decided not to do this. Her attempt to sleep finally succeeded several hours later. Will got up early on Saturday morning. He drove to his mom's house to pick up the kids and bought them breakfast at Denny's. His eldest, Sherry, asked, Where's mommy? Will's short answer was, she didn't sleep well. Mark, his 15-year-old son, asked, How was the dinner dance? Will replied, The music was okay, and so was the food. Both children saw that he was not in a good mood. They changed the topic to schoolwork. The drive home was fine because Will relaxed a little. But both of his teenagers were wary when they arrived home. Mel woke up and found that Will was not at home. No notes. She assumed that he had gone to pick up the children. When she came downstairs, just dressed, the three entered through the front door. She watched everyone carefully to see if Will had discussed the problem with Robert with them. She could see that maybe they weren't as happy as usual, but they weren't upset. So, no. An awkward calm settled over the house. Sherry and Mark were both gone for the day. Will busied himself with housework. Mel pretended to read. There was not a word between them. At dinner, they only said, 
Please pass the salt. When it was bedtime for the adults, Will went for a run again. He returned, took a shower and went to bed, barely speaking to Mel. She asked him, Did you have a good run? He replied, Yes. Then he rolled over to sleep. On Sunday morning, Mel tried to cuddle with Will, but he stood up as soon as she did. He quickly got dressed and went downstairs. The children both left and never returned. As they were leaving, Sherry asked Mark, What do you think is going on? I don't know. Something about that dance party, Sherry said. Yes, Mom must have done something. Mark asked, Wasn't it dinner for Mom's big client? Yes, but... It's no use guessing. If this continues, we can ask them. Yeah, maybe not. Sherry thought this might ruin everything. They each went their separate ways. Mel cooked Sunday dinner, good lasagna and cucumber salad. Both children took the supplement, but Will barely touched his portion, leaving a lot on the plate. This was very, very unusual for him. He just wasn't hungry, and when he was not hungry, he did not eat. He watched a football match in the evening until late. Mel pretended to be asleep when he came upstairs. Monday morning, after everyone had left for school and work, Will called his friend Mason Dabney, who was the manager at the hotel where the dinner was being held and where Robert Dawson was staying. The two had known each other since school and sometimes met for beer. After some greetings, Will asked Mason if Robert Dawson was still staying at the hotel. The answer was that he was booked for one more night and then would leave. Mel's commute to work was stressful. In fact, her tension was compounded by the fact that she had one last meeting scheduled with Robert and his vice president, Gloria. The meeting was supposed to wrap up everything. At 10 o'clock in the morning, Mel led them into the conference room. We discussed the details of the agreement and closed the issue. It took 20 minutes. Robert then asked, Mel, are you okay after the dance? Mel looked at Gloria. Robert said she was there. Mel replied, no, no, maybe I'm not okay. My, my passion could cost me a lot. Robert frowned. But nothing happened. He said, no, and you left. He knew that I wanted it. And you know that dance that we did. From the moment we left until now, he didn't say ten words to me. Didn't touch me at all. Mel was apparently stoic. Robert said, he's stupid if he gives up on you because of this. Even if we did that, he'd still be stupid. If he gives up on you, please call me. I don't want him to give up on me. She shook hands with each of them and left the room. Gloria looked at Robert and said, So, just the two of us for the evening? He nodded. I sent Gina away. Looks like Riku will be lonely again. Gloria smiled. Yes, I'll make it up to him later. He gets so excited. They returned to the hotel. Mel found it difficult to work that day. She gave up and went home at three o'clock in the afternoon. Will was at home, working hard on his computer. She looked in at him and then stood at the door. He didn't look up after the first glance. He then seemed to finish what he was writing and looked at her. She said, I'm broke. I couldn't work. Whose fault is this? Mostly mine, I admit. I was afraid to say anything, but I need... I need to apologize and find out where we are. The kids are worried. I'm worried. Is your friend Robert still in town? Yes. We had a short meeting this morning. I believe he is leaving tomorrow. He's a cocky idiot, full of himself, and you should have been full of him too. Mel spoke in a quiet voice. I said no when he suggested on the sly. He convinced me that maybe you'd agree with Gina. I should have known better. There was a long silence. Finally, Mel spoke. What can I do, Will? He said... I'm not sure. Nothing specific comes to mind. She said, Everyone has their weak moments, Will. He nodded. Mel knelt down in front of him. He was wearing his usual sports shorts and a t-shirt. He didn't resist when she pulled his shorts down. She pushed him onto the sofa that was across the room. Afterwards, they lay on the sofa for some time. Then she got up and left the room. Dinner was reheated lasagna. Mel was in a much better mood. The children noticed this when they returned home. Will had not yet emerged from his office. Mel sent Mark to pick him up at 6.30. He knocked on the door and said, 
Dinner. Will appeared and went down to the kitchen. Mel watched Will closely as he entered the kitchen. She was surprised that he didn't come earlier. The children also watched. Will smiled at them, all of them, and sat down to eat. He asked the children about school. He was talking to Mel about a project they were discussing, cleaning out the garage. The whole dinner went more normally than anything in days. The day ended with the kids going to their rooms and Mel and Will cleaning up. Will turned to her and said, Sex is good, but it's not enough. I understand that this guy was hot. There have been a lot of hot guys in your life. Some are probably much hotter than him. Why now? We worked together for months. He worked on me for months. It, it built up. He wasn't subtle in the end, and by then I was weak in front of him. I'm surprised you didn't go with him. She froze. She said, me too. I really wanted this, Will, but it shocks me. Makes me feel second rate. If only it... Mel smiled at him. You're a wonderful husband, a fantastic father. You're not second rate. That could mean a couple of things. You're the best, Will. Just not the best when it comes to sex. Will, I mean Gina could rock your world. It doesn't mean we're each the only desirable people in the world. The thing is, you're the only woman I want in the world. She seemed to blossom when he said this. But she sank when he added, but I'm not that for you. I'm your long-term choice. And that guy was your short-term choice. She didn't deny it. She said, well, I'll never know about him. He'd probably be a loser. I'll never know about any other guy but you. Will nodded. He got up and went up to the bedroom. Mel realized that she had a big job ahead of her. What Will said was irrefutable. She wanted Robert more than Will. On the night of the party, at least. Maybe a few nights around it. Perhaps even at this very moment. Over the next few months, Mel worked hard to convince Will that he was her one and only. In the end, it didn't work out the way she had hoped. They had sex. Sometimes really good sex. Sometimes he seemed distracted, and lately Mel was becoming more and more irritated by this. The relationship never returned to what it was before the night of the trade proposal. Mel knew this. Will knew this. Will was sitting one evening when he was alone at home. He tried to analyze what the problem was. From a distance, what Mel did didn't seem so bad. She craved a man who, realistically speaking, was hot. She hasn't changed. But she wanted this guy so much that she was willing to risk her family to get him. No matter how he looked at it, this simple fact that his wife wanted another man more than him may have been the deciding factor. What he told her was true. There was no other woman who could make him feel the same way. At least he hasn't seen one like this, and he's met some really attractive women, like, for example, the blonde divorcee from their street. But he never even came close to cheating. He was rock hard about it but he felt that he would now and forever be the second choice for his own wife. This thought tormented him. This bothered him more and more. He wondered if she thought about Robert when they had sex. He assumed so. However, he put it aside. He decided that he had to stay with her because his children would be hurt, even though they were older. He had to hold out for a while. And he still received regular sex and company from Mel. Well, sort of. About eight months after that evening at the banquet... Robert was due to come again. He again found himself embroiled in a legal dispute. This time it was a challenge to one of his chemical patents. Mel was a chemistry major in college. It was right up her alley, and she had a previous relationship with the main character. One morning, the three main partners of her firm called her, and Robert was there. Immediately she thought, this is the last thing I need. The three bosses of her firm were Abe Allenson, Bart Banson, and Caleb Carlton. Of the three, Abe knew her best and knew about the problems she had with Robert and Will due to the previous case. After some greetings, tense greetings, Abe said, Mel, we are all aware of some possible difficulties for you, but Robert has a serious business here, and he asked you to handle it. This is not unreasonable. This is a challenge to a chemical patent. You have technical knowledge and he knows you, Mel said. Abe, I just can't do this. You might know why. I have a family. I want to keep it. Robert entered the conversation. Mel, 
What happened before will not happen again. I promise you that. Mel shook her head. She said, Even if I believed it, Will would look at it differently. Bart intervened. Mel, this is a big deal for the firm and for Robert. Millions are on the line. You need to pull yourself together. Be strong. I'm sure Will will understand. Mel looked at him. She said, No, it's too much of a risk for me. Caleb said, It's a huge risk to abandon us. A job, really. Will will just have to be trusted. We're all adults, and Robert has assured us that he will refrain from any... Mel said, Will and I don't need my money. Not really. Still, I'll ask him about it. Robert said, If he objects, I can talk to him. Last time was good, but nothing really happened. I won't insist. I'm in trouble here. Mel was a ball of nerves that evening. She knew she had to wait until later in the evening to discuss this with Will. Will saw it. When they were alone in the TV room, he asked, What's the matter with you? Mel said, Robert has a new business. They want me to do it. It's a chemical patent. And you said, I said no. But they insist. It would cost me my job if I refuse. Will said, You know a bachelor's degree in chemistry doesn't mean that much. You'll still have to hire experts, right? They'll advise you all. Yes. But Robert is also educated in chemistry and I believe he insisted on me being on the team because he wouldn't have to pay someone else to train to understand him. He insisted on you because you are unfinished business to him. His ego is hurt. He will go after you. No. I mean, maybe. But he has a very good non-sexual reason for me to lead our team. He says he won't act like he used to with me. He has a lot at stake. Me too, Mel. You don't believe me? It doesn't matter if he tries to get after me. I won't let it happen. Will sat and was silent for a while. Then he shrugged. He said, How much contact with him will this case involve? He and Gloria have rented an apartment near the office. They'll be basically here for at least six weeks. Will just looked at her. He then said, I'll leave it up to you. Maybe this is a chance to show me who's really number one. You know what's at stake. Mel nodded. I know. Will got up and went to bed. Mel followed him a few minutes later. They settled into bed, and Mel stroked Will's stomach. She said, I need a dose of love. He gave it to her. It was slow going, but it picked up speed quickly and ended very well. Afterwards, they both lay next to each other. Mel said, Thank you. There's nothing to be thankful for. It was a pleasure. They slept well. The next day, Mel decided to take over Robert's case. He and Gloria attended a series of all-day meetings. Mel was assigned two assistants to the case, but neither of them had a background in chemistry. The next day also saw a series of fairly intense meetings. They ended up hiring two experts to assess the situation. The meetings continued late into the night and dinner was delivered to the law firm's office. Every night Mel returned home between 9.30 and 10, and by then she was exhausted. When they were in bed after the second night of work, Will asked, were there any problems? No, too much to do. And he has Gloria. Her husband doesn't seem to mind, I think. Will said, She told me it turned him on. She tried to convince me about you and Robert. I put her in her place. I really don't understand all this nonsense. Gloria owns it. That's what she told me. There's no way I would want a marriage like that. You don't have to worry about it. Ha, that's not what's bothering me. Will, if I sense any danger... I'll tell you, and we can talk. But I don't think that's going to happen. Cold. The intensity of work decreased after the first two days. Mel assigned her team to their task. Basic legal research. Robert and Mel then held various discussions with their experts. After two weeks, Mel was pretty sure Robert wouldn't be a problem. She told Will about this. He wasn't convinced. Every evening when she returned home, he watched her carefully. And... In bed, Mel. They both got along better. More effort on her part caused more effort on his part. But Will still wasn't convinced. If anything, Mel's efforts gave him some doubts. She spent more time with Robert than with her own husband. But he was sure that she had not entered into a sexual relationship with Robert. Yet. He thought it would happen at some point. She wanted it again. 
There was something about the way they worked together that caused her reaction last time. There was also some special attraction between them. Now she had been warned. He thought, however, that it might take her by surprise, and that would be such a shame. One evening, about four weeks into the case, after Robert had returned from a business trip to Pittsburgh, where he had been away for several days before returning that day, Mel came home on fire. The children were both at a neighbor's dinner. Mel took one look at Will and dragged him into the bedroom. She was like a volcano. It lasted a long time because Will made it last. It was a really difficult task, but worth it. Both, exhausted, lay recovering. Will turned to Mel. I guess I can thank Robert for that. Mel sighed. Yes. What are you going to do? What have you done? Didn't do anything. He didn't really try. Not openly. Explain. I mean, he didn't... You know, he didn't insist, but... Small touches. Indirectly suggestive comments. Will said. Kisses and hugs. No, damn it. I guess I should be grateful that you brought this home. Yes. How long? I admit, this is becoming a risk. I must complete this part of the matter, the training of experts. I really don't understand what's going on with this whole situation. He's not more. The other guys who have been courting you are hotter. Not for me, Will. Him and you. Pause. That is, you and him. Will rolled over, trying to sleep. Not so easy. Mel immediately fell asleep. In the morning, Will stopped Mel on her way to the door to work. He said, If you give up, if he tries and wins, he's a dead man. It doesn't matter how rich he is. Tell him. Mel was shocked. Will said this, looking at her with a firm gaze. She was left speechless. He patted her on the cheek. He said, So you both know what's at stake. I'll serve the time if I have to. Then he turned back into the house. He sat back down to breakfast and finished his eggs. He walked the children to school and sat down to explore. He had a plan of sorts. He hoped he wouldn't have to use it. I guess I should be grateful that you brought this home. Yes. How long? I admit, this is becoming a risk. I must complete this part of the matter. The training of experts. I really don't understand what's going on with this whole situation. He's not more... The other guys who have been courting you are hotter. Not for me, Will. Him and you. Pause. That is, you and him. Will rolled over, trying to sleep. Not so easy. Mel immediately fell asleep. In the morning, Will stopped Mel on her way to the door to work. He said, If you give up, if he tries and wins, he's a dead man. It doesn't matter how rich he is. Tell him. Mel was shocked. Will said this looking at her with a firm gaze. She was left speechless. He patted her on the cheek. He said, So you both know what's at stake. I'll serve the time if I have to. Then he turned back into the house. He sat back down to breakfast and finished his eggs. He walked the children to school and sat down to explore. He had a plan of sorts. He hoped he wouldn't have to use it. Mel drove to work in a state of mild shock. She tried to rationalize Will's threat. She tried to believe that he didn't mean it or that he wouldn't do it, but she saw him and heard him. She needed to complete the next two weeks with Robert before she could turn the case over to other lawyers, and she had to do it without any pranks. When she arrived at the office, she drank coffee and reviewed the latest materials from the experts. Robert and Gloria arrived at 10 and brought with them Jonathan Crisp, one of the expert chemists. He brought his Apple laptop. The four gathered in the large conference room they had been assigned for the case. The meeting lasted about an hour when they took a break. Mel went to her office, but Robert followed her and closed the door behind him. He said, What's happening to you? She replied, Will is very worried about this situation. I tried to soften it, you know. I told him that you are not proposing to me. Well, that's mostly true. That's not true at all, Robert. You're just spinning around the edges. But I know your purpose. Robert smiled. He said, We have chemistry. She laughed, but it wasn't funny. She said, Yes, I know. Yesterday I almost killed poor Will as soon as I got home. He should be grateful. Better sex through chemistry. 
He had a smirk. Mel said, he won't kill me, Robert. Just you. Is it worth dying for? Robert froze. He said, maybe it's worth it. Mel said, the point I'm making is that Will has, he has his own inner demons. Rage, slow but sure. He meant what he said. And what's more, he's capable of getting away with it. At that moment, Gloria knocked, and they returned to their meeting. Will didn't know if his threat would work. He meant it in an abstract sense. He knew that sooner or later, if Robert slept with Mel, he would hurt him and possibly divorce her. He thought about their conversations about Robert. It was strange for him to watch her vulnerability in front of Robert. She made it clear that she had never been so sexually attracted to anyone other than Robert in her life. Perhaps not even to your husband. Was it really her fault? She seemed overwhelmed by the intense desire she felt for this man. It was as if she had met the man she was meant to be with, at least sexually. Will decided that if his threat didn't work, he probably wouldn't kill or maim Robert. But he also decided that he was done being his own wife's second choice. If they completed the case without further incident and Robert returned home, Will wasn't sure he could continue the marriage. If Mel gave up, he would never touch her again. When Mel arrived home on time that evening, the family was having dinner together, dinner prepared by Will. Mel was relieved that Will seemed calm. They watched a basketball game and went to bed. Will asked Mel, how was your day? Did you talk to Robert? I told you, I conveyed to him, your attitude towards him. After that, there were no problems. Okay, but it's all on you, you know. Regardless of what I say, he'll probably continue. Once he gets home, we'll see. What do you mean? We'll see. If he's not next to me, he won't be a problem. Will looked at her seriously. He said, I feel like reheated leftovers and he feels like a five-star dish. She laughed at him. She said, I'm not a gourmet. I like your cooking, even if it's leftovers. She rushed at him and sat on his chest. He tried to put up some resistance. It was like a sand castle before a tsunami. Although it was nice to be swept away by her. For her part, Mel had loved their sex ever since the Robert thing arose. That night she took Will, imagining that she was with Robert. They both knew what she really wanted. And both were concerned about this in different ways. Will felt left out. Mel was afraid for her future. They never broke the impasse caused by the trade proposal. They may never come out. She never lied to Will about how he was only second in her desires. It was no use. She simply consoled him by having sex with him when he seemed depressed about it. The next few days at work were very stressful for Mel. They were preparing for the experts, now that they had expert reports from the other side. Mel worked all day Saturday as Jonathan Crisp was busy preparing for next week's trial in Stamen, Washington. He was scheduled to fly to Spokane on Sunday. He had a room in nearby Winesap on the Columbia River. The team of chemical experts completed their work the following Thursday morning. From now until the trial in Pittsburgh, Mel and Robert were able to work by phone or Skype if necessary. Over the course of the week, Robert subtly ramped up his seduction campaign, despite Mel's warning. But Mel was on guard against his techniques. That didn't mean she was safe. The techniques excited her towards him, and she brought it home. Will was obviously aware of Mel's growing passion, just like children. At breakfast one morning, Sherry said, You're keeping us up late at night, Mel replied. We'll get you some noise suppressors. Mark added, I already use them, but they are uncomfortable. Mel said, earplugs. It's not our fault, really. They left it like that. Robert invited Mel to lunch on Thursday. He flew to Pittsburgh on Friday morning. A preliminary hearing was scheduled to take place next week in U.S. District Court. Mel didn't need to be present. Robert took Mel to a nice restaurant near his apartment. Neither Gloria nor anyone else from the team was there. Mel was expecting this. She knew Robert would try to launch a full-scale attack. Normally, she would prioritize caution over risk, but she knew she would have to participate in a trial in Pittsburgh. A trial date has not yet been set, but will be determined at the hearing. She will have to be in Pittsburgh for two weeks, possibly including weekends. 
so she had to decide whether she should do it or quit. She saw this dinner as a test. Lunch was mostly pleasant. Robert made it clear that he wanted to eat and then go to the apartment for dessert. Mel refused, politely. They ate, the food was good, and Mel had a glass of wine. Only one. At the end, Robert slid down the round bench and hugged Mel. Mel didn't move away. Robert ran his hand over her cheek. Mel looked him straight in the eyes. Never in her life had she wanted something so much and given up on it. So this was the first time. She slid out from under the bench, panting. She said no. Robert was disappointed. He said, not yet. He then waved for the bill. Mel went home. She entered the house and found Will. She said, he's gone. I need you. They spent the evening in bed, among other places, until the kids got home a little after four. Mel felt like she dodged a bullet, or something similar in shape. The following week, a judge in Pittsburgh set a trial for mid-June, five months from now. Mel thought it over. She had a meeting with three partners about the case. She began by saying that she would not travel to Pittsburgh for the trial. Abe asked, Why? You did a great job preparing. I'm guessing it was because of your husband's concerns. But nothing happened, right? True. But it was here when I came home every night. In Pittsburgh, I'd be on his turf and Will would be here. Caleb said, Why don't you just, you know, do it? I mean, if you were in Pennsylvania, who would know? I would know. So Will would know, too. Maybe not right away, but soon enough. Abe said, We sympathize. But... I think we have to persist. Mel smiled. She said, try to find someone. She got up and left the room. As she left, Abe said, she's got us stumped. At least we have time. Maybe we can arrange for her to be able to counsel, maybe advice, from here. Caleb said, she's weak. I don't like being weak. Let's see if we can find someone as a sideline hire. That's what they tried to do. Over the following weeks, they interviewed four candidates. None of them were suitable. They made an offer to a guy from a big New York firm. He could handle it. He refused. Mel trained one of her assistants, Martin Blaine, so that he could cross-examine opposing experts and present his own. Meanwhile, Mel discussed the issue with Will. He expected this. He was not stupid and knew that there would have to be a trial if the case was not settled. Mel said one night, there's probably going to be a trial in Pittsburgh this year. They want me there. And you said, no, they were looking for a replacement. So far without success. And time is running out. Yes, if I insist, they'll probably fire me. Use the insubordination clause. You'll find something else. Maybe we'll write a book together. A novel with elements of romance where the marriage is in jeopardy. She started laughing. She said, Scarlet is looking at Rhett, who is shirtless. She's moving towards him. Is that what you mean? He laughed. He said, maybe with new names. I wonder if Scarlet will give in. Of course he will. This is fiction. We have to sell the book. What about you? Would you give up if you were there in smoky Pittsburgh? There's no smoke there anymore. I... I'm not going to lie, Will. It's entirely possible. But you know, the lawsuit is intense. And maybe this will solve the problem but probably not, right? I feel like I'm just some leftover. She said, well, Will, I'm not going. So that's it. I'm training Marty to handle the trial. He's smart. He and I can consult every evening on Skype. I'll have transcripts in the evening. Will said, I think you'll always feel sorry for me and blame me. That's not a good basis for continuing a relationship. Mel said, I love you. Only you. That's enough. Hope. That night, the two of them burned in the sheets. The children used earplugs, but they didn't help any of them. As the trial approached, Mel spent more time at work. Sherry graduated from high school and has already been accepted to Belham College, two hours away from her home in Pennsylvania. She and Will were busy preparing for her studies. Will tried to stay strong even though it was hard for him. On June 1st, ten days before the trial, Marty Blaine was hospitalized in Pittsburgh with heart disease. Doctors there explained his problem as the result of severe stress. 
he was banned from further participation in the trial. Mel's firm asked the judge to postpone the date. This was rejected. The judge said ABC is a large firm with many lawyers. She knew that Mel had been involved in the interviews and preparations and was a senior lawyer. When they returned from the trial afterwards, the team broke the news. At that time, he was sitting in his office with Mel. He relayed the news to her and said, There's no choice now, and while I feel bad for Marty, I think you're better off for us. I've booked you a room at the Westin next to the court. Mel nodded. She knew she had little choice. If she had resigned, she could still have been subject to disciplinary action by the bar. Caleb had connections there. She went home to pack her things and try to calm Will down. She did her best. Will helped her load the car and check the tires and oil. He then waved to her as she left for Pittsburgh. As he walked back to the house, he estimated the chances of her faithfulness to be 50-50 at best. He made some preparations, just in case. In a way, he thought it would be a relief if she was wrong. Since the exchange proposal was made, their marriage has been on the decline. Lots of sex, fueled by her passion for another man. But before the banquet, they were very close in many ways. They discussed their work, children, vacation plans, and other everyday things. They were interested in each other. Not so much lately. He missed this. He didn't know if it could be returned, if it was lost. Later that day, he explained to Mark and Sherry about the court emergency. Sherry's graduation ceremony was scheduled for Friday. The Pittsburgh judge conducted her trials four days a week and reserved for days for other business. It was the so-called garbagey day. So perhaps Mel could return for the ceremony. Will doubted it. Every eventing meal called home and talked to Will and the children. Usually the call came at eight or later. She had a lot of work to do. Jury selection was scheduled for next Monday. Over the weekend, Mel called in the morning. The rest of her time was spent with jury selection consultants. Around eight o'clock on Sunday, Will asked her how things were going with Robert. No problem, Will. I'm just too busy, and so is he. Is he involved in the preparations? Yes, I'd say he's involved, but... Will didn't find it funny, and Mel regretted making a joke. She said, Sorry, there's nothing going on in that regard. We work in the common room at the hotel. I sleep on the floor above, and he goes to his apartment. I haven't had any offers. Dinner is room service. The jury was selected Monday, and opening statements were made. Mel didn't perform then. Jill Blanton did it. She had diagrams and exhibits prepared. On Tuesday, the plaintiff began making his case. Two experts. The first one took all day. Mel conducted a slow, step-by-step cross-examination and made many good points. At the end of the day, she was satisfied. But she returned to the family room to prepare for the next one. He should have been the last. Now she has two. When Mel returned to the room, Robert was already there. He was happy and excited about his day in court. As Mal dropped off her business bags, Robert pulled her into a big hug and spun her around. She said, Whoa, big boy! Don't say hop until you jump over. Robert said, You were wonderful, Mel. Just fantastic. Thanks. Now I need to eat and get ready a little, then try to get a good night's sleep. Robert didn't make any moves on her, but he said, when we win this case, I will take you to my place and make you so happy. Mal simply shook her head and began reading her notes for the next witness. She ate. Then she went to her room and slept. The next day, Wednesday, went even better than the first. Mel methodically worked through the plaintiff's case, using their own expert. The guy resisted to the end, but it was a losing battle for him. This testimony was followed by two brief witnesses. The plaintiff concluded and the judge denied the defendant's motion for judgment. When Mal returned to the room, Robert was there again and no one else was there. Her experts were due to arrive at seven for the final run-through. Robert walked slowly towards Mal as they stood face to face. This time his hug was soft and sensual. And he kissed Mal. And she reciprocated his feelings just as things were about to heat up even more. The door opened and Jill Blanton walked in as Mel and Robert separated. The dinner delivery service also arrived. Robert left and Mel briefly prepared both witnesses. 
At 10, she went to her room. The next morning, when the team arrived at court, Herman Billings, the plaintiff's lead attorney, asked to see him. Robert, Jill, and Mel entered the waiting room with him and the main client, CEO Morgan Thompson. Thompson wanted to settle. Billings offered a proposal. Jill immediately made a counteroffer. She worked on it for a week. There were several rounds of bidding, but ABC had Robert in a very strong position. By 11 o'clock, an agreement was reached. Very beneficial for Robert. The parties drafted it and went to court. The agreement was filed and the jury was sent home. That afternoon, some details were decided and everyone was free. Mel was exhausted. She returned to the hotel, to her room, and slept for an hour. Then she got up and took a shower. Robert invited everyone to dinner at a club near his condo. Limousines were ordered for everyone. Mel called Will with the news. She promised to leave Pittsburgh on Friday afternoon, but Will missed the morning graduation ceremony. Will was not happy about this. The dinner arrangements were also not very pleasing. He said, Mal, this is probably when you're most vulnerable. I know, Will, I can handle it. Okay, congratulations. Don't have too much fun. Oh, well, the club was a place for dinner and dancing. They were a party of six, Robert, Mel, Jill, Jonathan Crisp, and two other ABC lawyers, Ellie Mason and Mick Delia. They were taken in a limousine and Robert met them at their table. The food was great, as was the wine. The dancing started at nine. Robert immediately invited Mel. Mal drank some wine with dinner. She agreed to dance with Robert, although she thought to herself that it was dancing that started her marital problems. Jill and Jonathan danced too, as did Ellie and Mick. The other two pairs sometimes switched places. But Robert and Mel danced six dances in a row, some fast, three slow. The slow dance at the end of this episode put Mel in a difficult position. She later recalled that she thought that she was four hours away from home and Will would not be able to find out. Robert whispered to her as they danced, Now we're coming to me. It's now or never. You're going to have the time of your life. Mal said, Just this once, Robert. No one needs to know. Robert thought that she wanted him so badly that she simply forgot about the three lawyers from her firm who knew very well what was going on. She allowed Robert to lead her out of the place and across the street to his condo. As they walked through the door, Robert turned her towards him and pressed her against the wall. He started with a deep kiss, which she returned. Robert took her hand and led her into the bedroom, where the bed was already made in anticipation. He turned her back to him and unbuttoned the top of her dress. He tossed it to the floor, leaving her in her shoes, panties, and sheer bra. Then he took off her bra and started caressing her. She moaned. Nothing could stop it. And when it was over, she snuggled up to him. Minutes passed, Robert said. I've never experienced anything like this, Mel. Never. She purred something. Then she said, Me too. Perhaps no one ever. An hour later, they made love again. When they were done this time, they took a shower and ate something to eat. Shrimps, a little celery, and apple slices. Then they returned to bed and made love slowly, face to face. They could look at each other's faces. Mel found it eye-opening. In the morning, they were still face to face. She separated and went to his bathroom where she found a new toothbrush and brushed her teeth. Then she took a shower. She was hungry and tormented by guilt. He said, thank you for the whole night. It was amazing. The best. She said, I should feel guilty, but no. It was so over the top. And the breakfast was great too. He took a shower while she got dressed. When he came out naked, she looked at him one last time. He was excited again. Then she left. She went to her hotel, checked out, and began heading back to Virginia. She loved Will, and she hoped he would never find out about last night. She reminded herself to talk to the other three about keeping their mouths shut. Will was worried about Thursday night dinner. He could imagine how badly this could end. Bad for him and for the family. He called Mel's cell phone at 11. The call went to voicemail. He didn't leave a message. At midnight, he called the hotel and asked to call her room. No answer. He did the same at half past two, claiming it was an emergency. Then at two and a half. No answer. He gave up and tried to sleep. 
The graduation ceremony went well. Sherry made a speech, but not like the first student. Will and Mark were impressed nonetheless. Will took them to lunch. Sherry then went out partying and Mark went to his friend's house for the night. Will was at home doing some errands. He had a training room in the basement. There was a heavy bag, an elliptical machine, and a bench press. There was also a small bathroom with a shower, a full-size refrigerator, and a kitchen sink. There was a small TV. He went to Walmart and bought a microwave and hot plate. He had just finished setting it all up when he heard a car in the driveway. He walked out the basement door into the backyard and up the outside stairs to the kitchen. Mel had just walked in through the front door. He heard her shout, Honey, I'm home. Like Ricky Ricardo. This showed him how nervous she was. He turned to her as she entered the room. He was leaning on the sink. She entered with a smile which immediately disappeared when she saw his face. She sat down on the kitchen chair. She looked at him. She said, Damn. Emotionless. Humbly. He said, I called your hotel room. Last time was at two and a half. Mel's hope of continuing the marriage ended at that moment. She said, It was just sex. No love. No love. She was crying quietly. He fell silent. He said, It doesn't matter. Maybe the memories will keep you warm at night. Or maybe he will. But not me. Never again. She said, I love you, Will. I always will. She stood up and went upstairs, picking up her suitcase along the way. Will headed back to the basement and finished his preparations to move in there for the next few months. He never returned from the basement that day, and she never came downstairs. He finished writing a chapter in a new novel about love. Then he thought about what the next book might be. He always received good royalties for his books, some of which were published under pseudonyms. He decided to write about his marriage and its end. A serious book that may take some time to write. He made a plan and turned off the computer. He then called his parents and informed them that he would be getting a divorce. Let her tell her family herself. None of the children were at home. Sherry agreed to stay with her best friend after all the partying. But both were supposed to return home the next day, Saturday. Will has already made arrangements with a lawyer to get a divorce if necessary. Zelda Morrison. She came highly recommended. He called her office ten minutes before closing, and she answered. He said, Hello, this is Will Baker. I'm afraid I really need an appointment. She said, I'm so sorry to hear that. Let me see. I have time on Monday at nine in the morning. Great. Can I give you the details now? Of course. Do you want to act quickly? Yes. I want her to be notified at her law firm as soon as possible. Okay. I'll open a case and write everything down. That's what she did. At the end of the conversation, she said, I can quickly prepare a lawsuit. Alternative grounds include infidelity or a no-fault divorce agreement. He said, let's stick to the betrayal for now. I think she won't deny it. The proposed agreement called for Will to remain in the home with custody of Mark. Sherry was old enough to live independently, without parental care. When Mark graduates from school, the house will either be sold or one spouse will buy out the other's share. When the children returned home at lunchtime on Saturday, Mel greeted them, and then Will came up from the basement. Both immediately realized that something was wrong. The four of them sat down at the kitchen table where they had shared so many meals. Will said, Your mom and I, well, we've come to the end of our marriage. We both still love you, but some things have happened. Mel was shocked. She had not had time to talk about all this with Will, and although she was well aware that the marriage was in deep crisis, the suddenness of Will's announcement stunned her. Both children turned to her. Sherry asked, What did you do, Mom? Because you know because of those sounds that we hear. Mel said, I slept with a client in Pittsburgh. One night, Thursday. Mark looked at his father. And, You're divorcing your mom? Will said, Yes. Sherry asked, just because of one night? Yes, but there's more to it than it seems. That one night, I don't know, it was hanging over me. Your mother knew it, and she did it anyway. Mel said, it's hard. Will said, not really, but for now I'll be sleeping in the basement. I'll still be working in my office. Maybe I'll be cooking. 
I don't know how that will work. There are details we need to discuss. I want to say that I'm very sorry that it came to this, but it did. There's no turning back. Mel left the table in tears. Both children turned to Will. He said, she, she found it so important to have sex with this guy that she was ready to destroy the family. She fought it. She lost. But, you know, even if she hadn't given in to him, after that, once she met him, nothing was the same for us. Sherry asked, what will she do? Will she live here? This all needs to be worked out. Sherry, I'm so sorry this all happened on your special day off, but I'm so proud of you. And you, Mark. They stood up and shared a group hug. Mel never came down while the kids were upstairs. When she ran upstairs, she fell on the bed and sobbed for a long time. How could she be so stupid and selfish? Her thoughts about sex with Robert seemed sour, like spoiled milk. Every time she thought about it, she felt nauseous. God. Eventually, she smelled dinner. Looks like burgers. She was hungry, but she had no intention of going downstairs. Will wondered, as he prepared dinner, whether Mal would be attracted to the smell. He thought not. He and the kids ate E. law and cheese burgers, cack from a pastry shop. Everyone cleaned up after dinner to get there, and the children went up to their rooms. In fact, they were discussing the situation in Sherry's room, but they could not come to any decisions. At ten o'clock, Will was sitting in the TV room, waiting for Mal. She appeared and sat down opposite him. He turned off the baseball and looked at her. He said, I'm sorry it all happened so quickly, but I didn't see the point in waiting. We're done. It's better to take the bandage off right away. She said, maybe we should, you should wait a little. It was just one night, Will. All these years and just one night. Mal, you were warned multiple times. I mean, why should I think this would stop? You know, you weren't even going to talk about it. And next time, you might as well get away with it. Maybe you already have. No, you know it's not fair. These last few months after the whole switching partners thing, I was living on the edge, and I was depressed because you clearly wanted him more than you wanted me. So you went and did it. But, but it was a mistake. A stupid mistake. No. This was your chance at the ultimate pleasure, and perhaps I would never have known. Tell me, was it as great as you thought it was? She didn't answer. She blushed and began to shed tears. He said, So, I can never compare with him, and I will never try. She said, Marriage is not just about sex. That's a big part of it, and for us it's gone, so there's no marriage. I could make you happy. I always could. And you made me happy too. But you still went to him. Now you can have him as much as you want, but not me. Your choice is made. He stood up and went to his new sleeping place. Mel sat in the chair and continued to shed tears. She then stood up and went to Sherry's room. She knocked. Sherry opened the door. She said that? Mel simply said, I love you. I messed up, but I love you. I'm so sorry I missed prom. Sherry hugged her but then said, Mom, how could you do this to all of us? I don't understand. Mel said, Me too, actually. Mark left his room. He said, Where is Daddy? Down in my sanctuary. I apologize to Sherry. I apologize to you. I love you both. Never forget. The next time will be difficult. She hugged them both and went to her room to cry even more. Mark turned to Sherry. At least we can sleep better. He went to his room. When Will went to the lawyer, she already had documents ready to sign. He signed them, and they discussed how things could happen. She told him it might take longer if Mel resisted. And Mel was an outstanding attorney at an outstanding law firm. Will shrugged. Zelda said, I feel like it's all happening too fast. What happened will shock you, but initial reactions are often thoughtless. Will said, I've seen this coming for months, and I made it clear to her what was going to happen. She did it anyway. So, it's happening. Now. I see no reason for a delay. The marriage is over. Okay. I can file electronically now and deliver it this afternoon. Sign here. Mel was in her office at two o'clock in the afternoon. She accepted congratulations from everyone without showing any visible reactions. When Abe called her in before dinner, he asked, What the hell, Mel? 
I mean, Jesus, Mel said. I was weak to him. I told you all that. He had his way in the end, and he won me over. Now I'll end up a lonely old woman. Abe said, I doubt it. You'll find another guy. Look at you. Not the one I love, Abe. Not Will. Give him time. Maybe he'll listen to reason. She nodded, but she thought differently. At two o'clock in the afternoon, her secretary brought the young man into her office, and he handed her the documents. She felt dead inside. Finally, she called Maury Slotkin, the firm's family law specialist, and invited him to Abe's office. She gave each of them copies of the documents. Abe said, Damn, that's fast. She said, He already knew what was likely to happen. Maury read the documents. He said, If the factual allegations are true, this seems fair. I understand that Will was a primarily stay-at-home parent. Yes, mostly. He works from home. You have 20 days to respond. Do you want to fight? Even if you do, he might get a divorce. Let me think. I need time. Mel went home early. Will was there, writing in his office. She looked in and said, I'm home. I received the documents. Fine. He didn't even look up from his work. Mal knew that he was deliberately ignoring her, and she also knew that he was not as calm as he pretended to be. She returned to the kitchen. She thought about all the time they spent together and how well they knew each other. That's why she could read it. His shoulder twitched. She's known this for years. The thought of losing such closeness was so depressing. She decided to drag out the process and wast as much time as possible. Perhaps he will cool down a little and start missing her. That was all she could think of. Will couldn't work effectively after Mel returned home. He was nervous and did not write. Every time he thought about his current situation, he imagined Mal naked with Robert. Her legs wrapped around him. Her face is a picture of passionate delight. He decided that he needed to do something. There was one thing. He researched it. Will then went down to the kitchen and started preparing dinner. He prepared a dish with chicken, onions, and rice. Spicy. He liked this recipe. It smelled so wonderful when it was cooking. Mel came in and sat down at the kitchen table. She watched, but did not speak. She saw Will's shoulder begin to twitch. After a few minutes, he turned to her and said, Cooking is harder when you're here. I'm sorry, I like... I like the idea of returning to as normal a life as possible while all this is going on. The kids, Sherry leaving. Until then, we probably won't get a divorce, I think. We could. Sign the papers. You shouldn't have any trouble finding a place. I already have a place. Same place as always. I like it. There was quite a long pause. Will was chopping garlic with his back to Mel. Then she said, I'll say this once, and I won't say it again. I made a very big, stupid mistake. A weak moment. All this time, and then, right at the end, I messed everything up and ruined, well, everything. If I could relive it, I would never do it. Will said, I won't be upstaged, Mel. And that's what you did. Well, we've been together for so long. We know each other so well. Oh, I hate the idea of it all going away. I just hate it. And I hate myself for causing it. Hate. Tears. Will turned to look at her. Her tears were like a knife in his stomach. He slowly slid down the tabletop to the floor. It was real pain. He leaned his back against the stove and began to cry. But he did not approach his wife. After all, she was the one who stuck that knife into him. Mel saw how much pain she had caused Will. I saw this clearly and up close. She walked around the table to him, knelt down and hugged him. She stroked his head, still crying. That's how Sherry found them when she walked in through the patio. Will saw her first, then Mel. They both rose to their feet as Sherry began to cry. They approached her, acting as one, without hesitation. They hugged Sherry and they all swayed back and forth together. Some time passed and Will said, The onions are burning. He went to the stove. Mel and Sherry sat down at the table just as Mark entered. He saw enough to be confused, but he sat down with Mel and Sherry. They watched as Will chopped up the chicken and tossed it into the pan, then seasoned it. It smelled so delicious. Mel said, Despite everything else, you are the best cook in the world. The children giggled nervously. Will turned around and nodded.
He said, 30 minutes. The dinner, as usual, was well received. No one talked about the elephant in the room. After eating, everyone went to their rooms. We'll remove it. This went on for weeks. Attorney Mel responded to the lawsuit and asked for a consultation. But the answer did not deny the facts. Mark went to football camp for two weeks. Sherry worked as a counselor at a nature camp in West Virginia, which left Mel and Will alone. Will was still cooking. Both worked. But there was almost no other contact. Absolutely no sex and no physical contact. The matter came to a hearing and a consultation was scheduled. By this time, Mel was very upset by Will's aloofness. He cooked and went down to his room. He was preparing breakfast, but when both kids left, he just made his own cereal. One surprising discovery was that neither of them felt sexual attraction to anyone. Will was kind of dead in that sense. He hadn't met so many women in his daily life. Those he saw did not interest him. Mel has had moments where she's thought about trying to get Will back, all the way. But she knew him and understood that she would only make the situation worse. Over time, as he seemed disgusted by even the thought of her touch, she gradually lost hope that the marriage could be saved. That's where she was when they went to their first consultation appointment with Dr. Mary Stevens. Dr. Stevens was an attractive woman in her 50s. She asked them to write down in advance the basics of what happened and how they would like to move forward. Mary Stevens was not one to beat around the bush. She began the session by simply stating, Both of you are deeply depressed. Both. Melody is losing hope that the marriage can be saved and begins to shift the blame. Will is tormented by the thought that he will never be able to satisfy his wife the way her lover can. The question is, what can be done? Will said, I think we need to be apart. Now I see her every day. It's torture for me. Mel looked at him. She said, We had good sex before Robert, and even when I craved him, we still can. Mary asked, But you understand that Will just doesn't want to be compared and lose in comparison. Mel said, Sex is sex. There have been maybe three times in our marriage where he hasn't satisfied me. Will said, But not like Robert, right? Mary and Will looked at Mel. She said, the night with Robert was great. He had the huge advantage of being new and different, and, you know, now Will would have that. It's been so long. Will said, don't be mean. Why didn't you go to him? Mel said, I try not to think about that night because I feel sick. I feel nauseous and have to distract myself. Mary asked, did you see Robert after that? No, he's been to our office twice, but I don't keep in touch with him. I'm warned when he comes and I try not to even cross paths with him in the hallway. Mary asked, Did you have any sexual desires other than for Robert? Not lately. At first I wanted Will. I wanted him, for him to just take me. But now I know he won't do that, and I don't want anyone else. Now I don't even want him. Mary asked, Will, why didn't you try to reconnect sexually? Because I see them together in my head. We are destroyed. Mary asked, are you attracted to other women? No. Even the blonde neighbor who was attractive before. Nothing. Just nothing. Over the weekend, Will drove to West Virginia to a rented cabin by a lake. He didn't take his computer with him, only a notepad. He's been having a creative block for the last few days. On Saturday morning, Will drove to Pittsburgh. He spent eight hours there, mostly on foot. He took no photographs or notes. I just watched. He spent Sunday in the hut. Then he called home and told Mel that he would stay a few more days to try to relax. On Monday, he went to Pittsburgh again. He spent 10 hours there, making more observations. He returned home on Tuesday afternoon. The trip helped a little with the creative block. He has fresh ideas for his next thriller. He and Mel attended a second counseling session. Will came in in a better mood. He connected this with the trip to the hut. Mary used to suggest medication for depression, but Will just took a vacation for himself. At the end of the session, Mel felt a little encouraged by Will's improved mood, but she felt an underlying tension that made her uneasy. At home, he had shoulder tics, and during the session too. On Friday, Will went to the cabin again. By then, 
Mark had returned home to be with Mel. Will went to Pittsburgh again on Saturday, and on Monday, returned home on Tuesday. On Wednesday of that week, Mark went to a nature camp where Sherry was a counselor. Will was working in his office when someone knocked on the door. It was his blonde neighbor, Linda Miller. She lived next door for six years and was divorced from her husband. She was 30 and beautiful. She had a seven-year-old daughter who attended the local primary school, Velma. She was with her father on summer holidays. Will was surprised by Linda's appearance. She said, hi, Will. I thought maybe you could look at my kitchen sink. I have a wrench. Linda was the opposite of Mel in many ways. She was blonde with light skin. She was curvy. She was very beautiful and young. She divorced her husband two years ago. And over all these years and before, she felt drawn to Will. He reminded her of her first boyfriend. And he was smart. Linda was not Einstein, but she liked smart guys. Now she saw the comings and goings from Will's house. In particular, she saw enough of him entering and exiting through the basement door. Will was wearing his usual workout shorts and a t-shirt. He put on his sneakers and escorted Linda to her house around the corner. She was also wearing workout shorts and a t-shirt. Flip-flops. Will was easily able to unclog the drain on her kitchen sink using her wrench and tape. She stood over him while he was under the sink. He could see her sexy legs all the way to the top. When Will finished installing the trap back, it slid out from under the sink. He looked at Linda and said, When we first met, I believe you told me that your father was a plumber. Linda smiled at him. She said, I wanted to see you, you know, on your back. I see you liked watching. I thought you might like it. Will noticed that she was now barefoot. She said softly, I want it. I usually get what I want from guys. Come with me and take off your shorts. She turned around, pulled her shorts to the ground, and walked away from him, swaying her buttocks from side to side. Will stood up, dropped his shorts and boxers, took off his T-shirt, and followed her upstairs like rats follow the Pied Piper. When they arrived in her bedroom, she turned around and took off her T-shirt. Will later thought that he should have thought about his own marital status. But at that moment, there was no such thought in his head. As Will and she got dressed again, Linda said, I see you walking back and forth through the back door. I can see across the yards. And I saw the bed being delivered there. I wonder if it's comfortable. Will replied, Yes, you'll have to try it. She frowned. As you heard, I can be loud. Yeah, I don't know if I'm ready to throw it in her face but maybe. I'd like to stay in touch. You will, Will. He went back into his house, through the back door, and took a shower. Then he sat down and thought about it all. He was always aware of the mutual attraction between Linda and himself, but the juxtaposition of her obvious seductiveness and his problems with Mel was unsettling. He put these thoughts aside and got up to write until it was time to cook dinner. He prepared cutlets and salad. For two. When Mel arrived, he lit the grill and said, Dinner is in 20. Would you like something to drink? Mel said, Sure. Maybe red. You choose. He poured her a mixed California wine. They had dinner on the patio. He asked her about work. She talked about the new project. Nothing about Robert. She made it clear without being too obvious. He said, I'm working on a new thriller. The ideas came while I was at the cabin, you know, away from my problems. Our problems? Tell us. He gave her a brief explanation about the killer hiding in plain sight. He didn't go into detail about methods or other details. Mel helped him tidy up and clean up. They finished their wine and each went to their rooms to sleep. The evening strengthened Will's thoughts about Linda. Mel didn't question his apparent change in mood. She also didn't mention divorce. A couple of times she glanced at Linda's house, but Linda was not on the street. In fact, Linda wasn't home either. She was on a date with a guy who she considered a long-term project. He was wealthy, although of short stature, a little thick too. But Horace was a pleasant man. Linda's divorce was due to her repeated infidelity. She had a great time with Will and was looking forward to continuing to serve her neighbor Mel, if she asked again. 
Over the next few days, Linda and Will had marathon sex every morning for about three hours. Linda found it exciting. Will was a little tired. When he arrived for his third counseling session with Mary, Mel was already sitting in her chair. Will sat down. Mary and Mel looked at him and said nothing. Finally, he said, I understand that you arranged this, Mel. Thank you very much. He wasn't being sarcastic. Mary asked, What? But Will was in no mood to be ambiguous. He said, You know what, Mary? Be honest. Mel said, We both thought it would be good for you. It was, wasn't it? Will said, Absolutely. So good. I'll never forget this as long as I live. He looked at Mel. Anger flashed across her face. Will grinned. Mary said, Don't be mean, Will but understand that Mel made the sacrifice. He nodded. I saw it. There's a big difference, though. Mel chimed in. Yeah, you've done it every day this week. The difference is that I didn't want you to cheat, but you arranged it for me. Because you cheated. Mel was confused. She said, I didn't like it, Will. Was she better than me? Will was smart enough to keep his mouth shut. He shrugged. Mary said, Will... This shows how much Mel wants to move past what happened. Will nodded. He said, yes, I can see it, and maybe it will work, in a few weeks. He started giggling. Mel snorted. I'll call her off. He smiled. He said, you can't. I'm winding her up. Mel sank into her chair. Then she stood up and said, okay, she gets the days and I get the nights. I need it, damn it. Will growled. You're beautiful and sexy. You can have anyone. Mel said, I can, but I want you. I love you. I only want you. When they had calmed down, Mary said, I'd like to schedule a session for both of you in about two weeks to see what happened. Mel and Will arrived home in their separate cars. It was Thursday afternoon. Will was going to a cabin for the weekend and had no intention of canceling those plans. He felt it was important to leave, he stayed there until Monday afternoon. After the failure of the consultation during a weekend at the lake, Mel and Linda talked about Will at Linda's house. Mel said, I think your involvement may now end. Linda smiled and said, My boyfriend Horace is short and chubby, but rich and sweet. Will is not short and chubby, and he has real talent, as you know. So, being invited, why should I leave? Because, because I want to try to stitch a marriage together. See if it lasts, and you're a complication. I wasn't a complication when you asked. No, it helped. A lot. But you obviously got a lot out of it, too. He's my husband, not yours. Maybe I could win him over. Mel's tone became dangerous. You really don't want this? Linda said, oh, okay. Can we split it up over time? I won't try to keep it, but I'd like to finish it gradually. Mel didn't believe it. She said, you can go out and get any guy you want. Linda's response was, so can you. I'll take care of Will for you. Mel thought about it. She said, I want my family back. Linda sighed. Okay, I want Monday night, all night, then I'll stop. I'll knock on his door after dinner. Tuesday you can knock. Mel agreed. When they parted, she said, just don't get knocked up. Linda said, another guy is a backup option. But I won't. Will returned home on Monday afternoon. In fact, he was able to write a lot on Sunday at the hut. That weekend, he made an offer to buy the place. He ordered pizza for dinner that night. Mel was kind of depressed, so he left it like that and went downstairs. At 11 in the evening, there was a quiet knock on his basement door. It was Linda. She said, This is our last time. All night long. Let's have fun. She was wearing a short chemise dress and nothing else. They really had fun. Fun loudly so Mel could hear. Will thought it was only fair. After that night, Linda moved on to other things. Her daughter was returning home, and she needed to pay more attention to Horace. On Tuesday, Will made a nice pasta dish and tomato salad. For two. He knew Mel would be looking for something more than just dinner. He decided not to resist. Between them, they were as balanced as possible while maintaining their marriage. He decided it was best for everyone. Bye. That evening, he invited Mel down. 
She stayed all night. She woke Will at 5.30 in the morning. Then she got hungry, and he prepared breakfast. As they ate, Mel asked, Are we okay? We'll never be equals. You threw me a bone, and I threw it, but it was you. I would never approve of what you did. Still, it was nice of you. He said, I have to work. I'm going to the cabin this Thursday. I have a separate project there, and I need space. I made an offer to buy it. If I buy it, I'll take you there. Mel said, I never asked much about it. Either I get it or I don't. I'll find out soon enough. Will was very productive over the weekend. His plans and plots for the new thriller worked well. He also made a deal to buy a cabin. He returned home on Monday morning. He and Mel slept in their marital bed all week. Sleep was only a secondary consideration for her. She felt like she had fallen behind sexually and needed to catch up. Her efforts were admirable, Will thought. On Thursday, when Mel got home from work, she said, Will, I have to tell you that Robert, well, he seems to have disappeared. On Sunday, he had dinner at a restaurant he frequents on his way home. He left there. After a few drinks, he didn't make it to his apartment six blocks away. That's what Abe told me. The search began. Now the police are looking for him. Will listened carefully and fell silent. He said, I'm sure he'll show up. Somewhere. Maybe he's got a new crush, or maybe he's hooked up with the wrong woman. Mel looked at Will for a long time. She said, Will? He said, No, I didn't mean you, although... Mel and Will were back on track after about a year. It was difficult at first, but both worked hard, both on their own and with Mary. They spent a lot of time at the hut, almost every weekend. The bed there was worn out and needed replacing. In the end, each of them only had the other as an option. So, after a year of uncertainty, they seemed to be okay. Will? Will was always on guard. Always on your guard. And Mel knew it. As it turned out, even a year later, Robert was never found. The longer he was not found, the more confident everyone was that an accident had happened to him. His business accounts were in order. There was no apparent reason for his voluntary disappearance. But he was involved in two transactions with dubious characters. One deal fell through and money was lost. The authorities are focused on this. They also called in Gloria's poor husband. There were no arrests. Nobody asked Will anything.